Welcome to the Revolution of Interdependence podcast. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about the Great Resignation. And I'll be sharing with you five reasons why I believe it's happening and how it relates to our topic of interdependence. So my name is Will Sampson, and I'm a social scientist who helps guide companies and executive to, executives to new levels of growth. Now, if you want to improve your life all by yourself, look, that's your business. But if you want help from others, that's our business. And that's what this podcast is all about, helping each other succeed. Now, we do that by creating a growing revolution of interdependence. One of the greatest challenges to the American economy right now is what's being called the Great Resignation. Now, this Great Resignation, it came upon us like a, like a traffic accident that we should have seen from five miles away. You know, when the movie Office Space came out in 1999, it was like a blueprint for this Great Resignation. If you haven't watched the series Severance yet, it's currently on Apple TV, you need to, because it's about people who are getting brain surgery so they don't have to think about home when they're at work and they don't have to think about work when they're at home. The reality is that we have this deeply broken work and organizational culture and it is not going to get fixed tomorrow. It's not going to get fixed either by organizational development programs, even though, frankly, that's part of what I do with companies and clients. I help them fix broken corporate culture. But the great resignation is deeper than that, and it relates to the key idea that we raise in this podcast, which is the theme of interdependence, how we help each other succeed. The reality is that there are some fundamental problems with our culture driving this great resignation, and certainly no systemic changes are going to fix those problems. Let me share a story from one of my coaching clients, because he's one of the statistics. He's one of the four million plus people that have resigned every month for the last four months. So we were discussing his plans, you know, where does he want to go next? And so I asked, you know, why did you, <laughs> why did you leave your position, especially since you didn't have something else lined up. And the two things that he shared with me were really striking. First, he said, I didn't know how to stay there and continue to be human. And then he said he was tired of feeling like he lived on what he called work island. Work island, that was my obvious next follow-up question was, tell me about this work island. What is this? Are you talking, I asked him, are you talking about what work life has been like during the pandemic? And he said, well, certainly sure, but Work Island for him existed long before then. Then he told me how he used to go to the office every day and he would sit in meetings all day, every day, except he wasn't really in meetings in a physical room with other humans. He was sitting at his cubicle on Microsoft Teams, <laughs> chatting with or, or meeting with five or nine or, I don't know, 22 other people who were in the same building. They were all communicating via Microsoft Teams. And this idea of a work island, of, of being alone in our work and the way in which it's driving the great resignation, look, it's so much deeper and it's been going on for so much longer than what we're experiencing in this pandemic. What's driving the great resignation and how does it relate to a lack of interdependence? So in today's podcast, I'm going to unpack five reasons why the great resignation is happening now and how solving those issues behind the great resignation are really going to require a change in our view of interdependence. So the first reason driving the great resignation is that we have a complete failure of expertise in our work and organizational culture. I shouldn't say complete, but we've got a significant failure of expertise in our work and organizational culture, especially in the skills that are required to deal with the problems we're facing today. And the bigger the company, the more likely it is to rely on um, what's called uh, quote-unquote consulting. See, we have these big consulting firms. I'm talking about Accenture, PMG, KPMG rather, Booz Allen, Deloitte, PwC. 
These are the consulting firms that American corporations rely on heavily for their work, and having consultants can certainly be a good thing if, in fact, they're actually consultants. You know, the word itself, consultant, um, it means one qualified to give advice. So let's say somebody spent 20 years working in human resources. Well, they are qualified to give advice on human resource needs. But we've created this consulting culture where individuals enter into the consulting work stream. They never actually develop any expertise in any area but consulting itself. So we have consultants who are experts on consulting, not on IT, not on HR information systems, etc. See, there's this pipeline from some of our best schools into some of our best consulting firms. Individuals are recruited straight out of Brown or Stanford or Harvard, along with you know, all the great state schools, the smaller schools, and they're recruited straight into this stream of consulting. So they learn the methodology of a consulting firm then they move out and start engaging with clients with that particular consulting firm's framework for how they deliver their advice. So what do we have now? We have a group of people who are skilled and capable at delivering a framework, but frameworks are, they're good for solving complicated problems. So look, when I wanna buy a car, I definitely want to know that the engineering firm uh, or the engineering group of that auto manufacturer had a good framework for building reliable brakes. Because that's a complicated problem. Like, I want to make sure that the team developed the brakes in my car, that they've really thought about all the factors that could go into braking properly. But building a braking system for automobiles, that's a complicated problem. It benefits from a well-followed framework. Most of the challenges that our companies face today are not complicated, they're complex. They're problems that require really looking at the interplay of different ideas. They require deep expertise in all the areas that are being affected. The challenges our companies and organizations face today require the ability to understand and address the interdependence of multiple factors related to people and to culture. But instead, what the consultants are bringing is a set of repeatable processes, <laughs> literally all the way down to like their PowerPoint decks. You know, I work for a lot of different tech companies and I can usually look at the first few slides of a PowerPoint deck and tell you what consulting company it came from. Oh, I lost them. that's a PwC deck or that's an Accenture deck. Now, you might be saying, well, what does all that have to do with the great resignation? Here's the reality. People are abandoning what they think of as bullshit jobs. You know, when we look at the data, people are largely quitting jobs because those jobs just don't have meaning to them. Companies that don't pay attention to what, to what I sometimes call the fourth constraint. Um, you know, in corporate speak, you often hear executives and project managers, they'll talk about triple constraints, time, scope, and money. But there's this fourth constraint, it's people, it's culture. And it leads, not paying attention to it leads to jobs where people don't want to stay and they don't feel they contribute. See, I have a first row seat on this because my corporate work is exclusively around the area of change management. So when I see the consultants show up, I know they're going to be more than capable to address things like time, scope, and money because frankly, those are easy things to measure. But people, culture, they're really difficult to measure. And they're not repeatable, not in any kind of meaningful way. They require thoughtful analysis um, and understanding of the interplay of different ideas. And I see this quite a bit because I work mostly with large tech companies going through organizational changes. And the consultants come in and they make sure that the time and the scope and the money, all those things are aligned. But 
not necessarily the people. See, time, scope, and money, those are complicated problems. But if, because they interrelate to each other, but then they need to be done sequence, in a certain sequence. So change one factor, and the other two are going to change, but largely in sort of predictable and repeatable ways. But humans and culture, we are, we are complex things. And companies and organizations, they don't often pay attention to the need to help people navigate change, to understand who they are, where they find meaning, where they find purpose. And that's what, that is what is really driving this lack of meaning and driving the great resignation. Workers, workers are viewing the available jobs as undesirable. And that's at the core of what's driving the, these resignations. So how do we solve the problem? And this is, this is where I think interdependence becomes such an important topic. Paying attention to interdependence allows us to ask, how do we hear from each other? It allows us to ask, how do we listen to each other? See, when we focus on interdependence, we're more likely to ask, how do we make sure everybody has a voice? You know, the movie Office Space may have been more than 20 years ago, but change the name of the company, change a few of the variables, and that movie could have been made today. So we've got to begin to build a sort of true expertise in humans and culture back into our businesses, back into our organizations. Now, reason number two, the second thing driving the great resignation is that American corporations, especially Western corporations generally, are not really willing to engage in transformation. They want to make problems go away. Now, I realize that's a broad statement, obviously, and within every organization, there are executives and managers who are deeply interested in transformation. And even in some of the largest, or, or even some of the best companies, I should say, there are managers and executives who are not interested in transformation. But, you know, we're in the midst of a time of vulture capitalism. What's, what's true of our time is that we view the successful companies as growing their profits quarter over quarter. They're, they meet all earnings expectations every time there's a market call. And in that environment, it's really difficult to enact true transformation. See, we like the consulting approach. We like the repeatable processes because it feels like we're getting stuff done. <laughs> you know, 50 people met and we put a bunch of stuff on a spreadsheet. But the type of transformation that's required that's the harder work. So we see these high-priced consultants and higher-end executives focusing on project plans and project budget budgets, and they tell themselves that they're doing the hard work. But I'm going to suggest that that's really the easy work. The hard work, the hard work is creating organizations that are committed to transformation. Now, how does that relate to interdependence? Well, it's a mindset. Transformation is a mindset. And that means that everyone's on board. It means that everyone has a voice. It means that every perspective matters. Now, transformation also means that a company or organization finds ways for each person to bring their best contribution. You know, in a world where we're simply trying to fix problems we can name or identify, and not really do the, the hard work of deep transformation. People are going to keep quitting. Because, again, they feel like they're living on work island. They feel like they're off on their own. See, for our workers today, a big part of the world is made up of friends and family and social life and all kinds of other things that they do outside of work. And when they walk into work... They feel like they're walking into a world that wasn't designed for them and isn't able to change itself. The way to deal with and the, 
that and the, really the way to get people to love their jobs, to love the jobs that are available, is to move our organizations from places where we fix problems to places where we transform people and processes and customers. And this goes a long way to explain why you know, Web3 and crypto culture are one of the most popular destinations for high-skilled workers who are leaving during the Great Resignation. Workers with higher levels of social capital, including high-skilled uh, tech workers, they realize that they have the power to shape companies, organizations, workplace culture in a way that allows them to bring their best contribution and ties their own individual sense of purpose and meaning to the organization's culture. The third reason why we are seeing the great resignation right now is that our leadership models are broken. In fact, I think they're bankrupt. You know, if we learned anything from the pandemic, what we learned was the complete inadequacy of our leadership models to meet new and unforeseen demands. So here's the question. Will we change our ideas about leadership? Will the pandemic and the potential learning from it change how we lead our companies and organizations? Here's the reality. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Because if insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, uh, then the jury's still out over whether American corporate culture and Western corporate culture is sane. The greatest likelihood is that some companies are going to be transformed in a positive way by the pandemic and others will continue a downward slide. You know, I see this happening even with my clients. I had a client, a big, a large corporation who was trying to figure out how to bring people back into the office after the pandemic. They had an employee who'd been living near the office in a more expensive area, but during the pandemic, because everything was remote, this individual moved to a place where they could combine two generations of households and have a much better, a more sustainable way of living. But now that the worst of the pandemic was winding down, this company was trying to figure out how to bring their people back into the office. And so uh, with regard to this one employee, the idea was that they would offer to them, they would offer them two choices. They would either help them move back to the expensive area near the office, or they would pay them less because they now lived in a cheaper area. And that, to me, that is an example of the kind of shitty leadership that's driving this great resignation. Because my question to that client was, were they a solid contributor during the pandemic? Oh, yeah, they would say, yeah, no, they were, they were really great. In fact, they earned their quarterly bonuses. Uh, they grew their work. So the obvious follow-up question was, well, will they be able to continue to, value, to grow their value remotely? You know, let's say they could only come into the office a couple times a month. And their answer was, well, you know, maybe they could, but... We have a policy that we pay people based on where they live. <laughs> now that, that to me is like a classic example of the terrible leadership models that drive our corporations and our organizations. And that's going to have to change. Why? Now you may ask, why is the leadership model so broken? Well, it's old. I mean, really old. You know, it's older than Toyota. It's older than the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> How old is our leadership model? I know it sounds like a bad comedy routine, but ask yourself what metaphor we use to describe leadership. Often we talk about a pyramid. It's small up top, up top and much, much bigger on the bottom. You know, like when we built pyramids. <laughs> And that model worked, frankly, when there were dramatic differences in skill levels, knowledge, ability across the workforce. That is not the world we live in anymore. But, but 
it's still the leadership model that we have. It's a model that's based on enforced hierarchies and responsibilities granted by job description. And how do people feel about that model today? Well, I don't know. Why don't you ask the 4.3 million people who resigned in January of 2022 alone? Nobody wants these jobs. See, our way of leading people is broken. And frankly, it didn't necessarily get better during the pandemic. What seems to be true from the data, from the data that we're looking at, is that the companies that had a healthier leadership model got healthier. And the companies that didn't got sicker. Now, there were definitely some exceptions, but those exceptions were primarily companies that were uniquely qualified to benefit from the pandemic. So these are the Amazon, DoorDash, Instacart, Zoom. But even those companies didn't necessarily grow healthier organizationally during the pandemic. So how do we solve this leadership problem? Well, this is where I think interdependence is a critical concept because the way we heal this problem is to move from leadership to what I call contributorship. Now, leadership says that my authority derives from my title or from my position on the organizational chart. Contributorship says that my authority relates to what I contribute to the network. It relates to my influence in the network. It relates to my contribution. Leadership says, well, look, I must have a very strong organization because I have all the right spots filled on my org chart. But contributorship has a different mindset. It says that I have a resilient ecosystem that's going to produce profit because I have a balance of cognitively and strategically diverse people on my team. And this idea didn't just come out of my brain. It's well documented in the research. There's a Harvard Business Review study from 2017 that demonstrated when you've got cognitively diverse teams of people, that those teams can solve problems 25% faster. So when we think about fixing the broken work culture that's leading to the great resignation, a third way to address it, and this is directly related to interdependence, is to move away from leadership to contributorship. And there are ways to measure this factor. I use a tool in my practice called the AEM cube, but there are other tools that do it. Now, problems like our broken leadership model are not ones we cannot solve. They're simply problems we haven't solved yet. Now, the fourth problem driving the great resignation is the way we manage our companies. See, we, we take this engineering approach that focuses on repeatable, predictable processes. Now, let me ask you a question. How, uh, tell me how a repeatable, predictable process was going to help us in a global economic collapse that was caused by some aggressively mutating virus. <laughs> I mean, here's the deal. The pandemic showed us that a lot of what we do in our companies just isn't repeatable, at least not the way we think it is. And it's not like our management models were working anyway. I mean, many of our companies fail to execute on their core strategy. Projects fail all the time. Because I work in large corporations doing change management, I, I consistently see the wreckage of failed projects all around me. And at least in the IT space, about one in six corporate IT projects fail so badly that they actually threaten to shut down the company. So just like our pursuit of a failed leadership model, our failed management model is wrecking us. It's destroying us. We need a new management model. And what we really need what we really need is a new corporate operating system. It would be an operating system based on interdependence, based on being transformational, based on elevating human expertise, not process expertise. And one of the ways to build interdependence into our management model is to move 
from project and program management to design thinking. Now, not for every initiative, obviously. There are some efforts that call for the kind of repeatability that's off, that is offered by projects and programs. But the major changes we face, and those, these are the ones that are the difference makers for the companies that succeed, they require design thinking. Now, how would design thinking be different? Well, it would begin with what I described earlier as that fourth constraint. You know, we so often think of our work, especially in corporate settings, in terms of time, scope, and money. What if instead we thought about it from the perspective of the group that was having the problem? What if instead of thinking only about time, scope, and money, we started with the real world people who are having real world problems? And then we began to imagine solutions for those problems. We prototype those solutions. See, that would give us the ability to move beyond traditional project management. And I think this is where interdependence becomes so important. Design thinking brings people into the decision-making process. It requires a community of thinkers that would, it would allow us to guide people through unfamiliar problems. And if the pandemic taught us anything, it's that unfamiliar is the new norm. You want to solve the great resignation, then get your people involved in creating the solutions and the culture that will move your company forward. The fifth reason for the great resignation is that our companies and our organizations suffer from a lack of meaning. You know, in my practice, I deal with individual coaching clients and I talk with them about meaning and purpose and, you know, I ask them what is their unique value proposition in the world. Companies should have meaning and purpose as well. As well. And when we look at the reasons people are resigning, we see again and again in the data that they're resigning from what they call, frankly, bullshit jobs. Because they feel that it's, they're being asked to do bullshit work often in a bullshit company. It's a company that just doesn't make sense. I mean, the only reason it exists is to make money. And look, making money's a really great thing, but alone, it's not sustainable. The last 40 years have been the era of hyper-capitalism. And the outcome has been a small class of ultra-wealthy people and a quickly growing set of workers who are disaffected, disillusioned. And frankly, they just don't want to keep showing up if it's only for the money. And that's especially true if it's only for the money of the CEO and the leadership team. So how are we going to use the last several years of upheaval to build meaning into our companies? How can we learn the lessons of the pandemic and the lessons of the last 40 years and change this massive outflow of workers from our corporations and our organizations? Well, I think it really does boil down to what meaning we derive from the experiences that we've been through. Now, that was obviously that's always true. If you look at the last hundred years or so, though, there are two great world events that are worth looking at for examples of what we could do next. In 1945, we, we had the end of World War II, and after that war, we had this national outpouring of interdependence. You know, people came together to fix some of the really great problems in our world. And I'm not naive, <laughs> the 50s, 60s, they didn't fix everything. But in the decade or so that followed World War II, we saw some of the most significant legislation in our nation's history. We had the birth of the modern civil rights movement. We had the passage of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. Now, unfortunately, those things have been undone in many ways, but the reality is that we, we reacted to global conflict by working together. And ironically, in the United States, we created a bunch of programs that have now become the 
bedrock of the billionaire class. I mean, uh, it's ironic. But after World War II, we created some of the most important and valuable public programs the world has ever known. The enormous efficiency, though, of the U.S. federal government in creating public goods like the Internet and the interstate transportation system, frankly, it's the only reason we can differentiate between Elon Musk and Elmer F. and Fudd. <laughs> you know, while our response to World War II, it didn't fix everything, it did create a climate where we were able to address meaningful problems. But we have a second example from the last hundred or so years, and that's the, the last global pandemic we had beginning in 1917. After that scare, what happened? Well, we had the Roaring Twenties where we partied ourselves into oblivion. Here's the reality. Our companies are simply reflections of the culture. And after 1945, we had the greatest economic expansion we've seen in this country. After 1917, we had a global economic collapse. So what's going to happen next? We don't know, and the jury's still out. But here's what we do know. The world is changing, and our companies have to change with it. Or we're going to continue to see this massive outflow of people so to bring about this change, we really need to, we need to imbue our companies with a sense of meaning. And how do we do that? Well, anytime I'm talking about meaning, I'm going to turn to Viktor Frankl. You may know Viktor Frankl uh, wrote the book Man's Search for Meaning. And he was, he was developing this significant therapeutic model that he called logotherapy. And then he found himself on a train to Auschwitz. Frankel believed that if he could test that theory, his theory, even in the worst of times, that it would validate his idea under unimaginable human conditions. So how did Frankel say we find meaning? Well, he said we need three things. We need a meaningful project to work on. We need a redemptive perspective on our suffering. And we need a community of people who love us. Now, Imagine if our organizations became places where people had meaningful projects to work on. I don't exactly know what redemptive perspective on suffering would look like in our work and organization, our work in, in our companies and organizations, but certainly those places would be places where workers could bring all of themselves, 100% honestly. And they would be in a culture where they didn't live on a work island. What if we created a community of people in our companies who loved and supported each other? Now, this search for corporate meaning, it was happening long before the pandemic. The Business Roundtable, that's an organization of American CEOs, and a few years ago they said that we need to rethink the American corporation. Yes, it's true that American companies are profitable, and yes, the American economy is still leading the world. But it's also true that Americans deserve an economy that allows each person to succeed through hard work, through creativity, and allows each person to lead a life of meaning and dignity. So what would corporate meaning look like? Well, I think we would move away from pure profit. And our companies would begin to have a balance, a balance scorecard, if you will, that includes profit, yes, but also people and social impact. You need profits. You, you know, if you don't have profits, you don't have a company. But the early data from the pandemic seems to indicate that the companies that weren't tailored, weren't otherwise tailored to thrive in a time of scarcity, so the Amazons and the DoorDashes, the ones that seemed to grow during that time were those that had a deep sense of purpose. Now, uh, I'll give you an example. There's a lot of payment systems out there, for example, but Gravity Systems is one that grew dramatically during the pandemic. Part of the reason is because Dan Price, the CEO, recognized that his company needed a sense of purpose and his people needed a sense of value. And so he created a cap 
on salaries that was actually pegged to his salary as the CEO. Now, perhaps the greatest takeaway from the pandemic and the great resignation is that people, human resources, have become this incredibly competitive resource. Workers, and I am not just talking about high-skilled workers here, workers in retail, workers in hospitality, other service industries, these workers have a level of control that would have been virtually impossible to imagine not that long ago. So to create companies where workers feel like they have a sense of meaning, it's going to require that we create a corporate ecosystem where each person is able to contribute their best self to the company. It's also true that the best companies, those companies that retain employees, but also produce significant profit and they leave their marketplace, those companies have social responsibility built into their core ecosystem. And while I would love to live in a world where, you know, the better nature of our human condition would make us all want to leave the world a better place, the market reality is that social impact has become a major competitive edge from a brand perspective and from a recruiting perspective. This is especially true when we're attracting millennial talent. So when we look at the breakout numbers for people who are participating in the Great Resignation, we see that many people are leaving because they want to find a life of meaning and a company that makes a difference. So those are the five reasons why we're seeing the Great Resignation. And those are five reasons directly related to the need. It's almost an existential need to build interdependence back into our operating systems for our companies and for our organizations. And folks, that's a wrap for today. I appreciate your time. Please follow me on social. You can find me at Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn at the Will Sampson. Please hit the subscribe button below to be notified of the latest episode. Thanks, everyone. I'll see you next week on the Revolution of Interdependence podcast.